Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm the Prep Athletics founder, Corey Heights. And on this podcast, we'll be talking about prep schools, prep school basketball, recruiting, and other parts of life that we all might find interesting. Today is the first podcast interview uh, that we're having, and it features a, a young man I've, been, I've known since 2008 named Marcellus Barksdale. And to just give some context on how I first met Marcellus, I moved to Lexington, Kentucky, which is my hometown, back in 2008. And I moved there from Whistler, British Columbia, uh, where I was coaching basketball. And in Kentucky, I actually hooked up with Brad Carter, who was my point guard in high school, and Tommy Houston, who was uh, our assistant coach at Lexington Catholic. And they were coaching at our back then rivals, Lexington Christian. Um, so I hopped on board with those guys. And Marcellus actually played for a team in our district named Tate's Creek. And Tate's Creek was a perennial top five school uh, during the years that I was coaching there and during the years that Marcellus played there. In my first year in 2008, Marcellus was a sophomore. And Marcellus, I don't know if Lexington Christian beat you even once during those three years. Do, do you recall? Uh, we had some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe maybe one game. But I know it, it, was, all, it was always some really good games, though. They were always good. We could never... We could never close out, and um, it, it, it was hilarious. You, you, you all would always be, you know, I always remembering, you know, I, we always knew that we we would win eventually. That you know, regardless of what the score, two minutes, you know, down six, whatever, you know, we always felt like the door was always going to be open. So, you know, it, it was it, it was fun. You, you guys had some amazing teams, though, and honestly, you know, arguably, I, I'm not sure if there's many high school staffs. Um, just with the caliber of coaching that you guys were able to, to have over there as well. So it was a phenomenal job with that, with that program, by the way. Oh, thanks a lot. It was, uh, it was a fun team. We had a lot of talent in those teams. But uh, that's, you know, after uh, leaving Lexington Christian, I went to Washington, D.C. and coached at Gonzaga High School. And I kept telling people, hey, you know, the conference Gonzaga, DeMatha, Paul VI play, and there is a lot of talent. But as far as basketball IQ goes, <laughs> yeah. um, Kentucky, it's hard. It's hard to beat. And there might be some guys on the court that don't look like ballers, but just they've been playing it the right way their entire lives. They've had great training, good coaching. And it, it's, it's, it's just something special that unless you've, you've grown up there, it's kind of hard to, Definitely. to translate. Um, Marcellus, one thing I want to discuss with you first is you've had a lack of sleep. Why, why are you <laughs> tired right now? Man, I, uh, three weeks ago to tomorrow, actually, uh, my, my girlfriend and I had our baby girl. So Emory, Marie Barksdale, it's been a, uh, it's been a wild ride so far. Again, it's super, super fun. Um, you know, just, just literally looking at love in a, in a different way. And, uh, you know, literally my, my daughter looks just like me. <laughs> it was really kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, it's a blessing, but she cries if she's not eating all day and all mm -hmm. night. So we're still getting adjusted in. You know, you actually gave me a good rec book recommendation uh, before we got on the air. So I'll definitely give that a good uh, good check out because I'm trying to get all the tips, advantages, just the, the competitive spirit in me. I, I, I need to get the drop on my opponent and, you know, put my scouting report and game plan together and see if we can go and execute. So Yeah, absolutely. Well, having a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, I was in your shoes. And now we've actually got another daughter coming on the way in December. So I'm going to be put – back into training camp or basic training <laughs> and it's the, the worst part is the sleep deprivation <laughs> aside from that it's great but the that really puts you and your partner to the test so uh you're in the throes of it now so good luck with that yeah no, it's been it's been a wild ride so you know I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to it so changing diapers getting pooped on all that good thrown up on I, you know i'm running a basketball facility I, i've had my fair share and I, I must say you know i'd rather clean up my daughter's messes than you know, random spectators and <laughs> grown it, people. Isn't that amazing? Like the first time your daughter poops on you or throws up on you, you just don't care. Yeah. That's it's just the, like, uh, you know, it's, it's almost just like, uh, you know, you have your first 20 point game, <laughs> you know, or you, you, you sprain your first ankle or, you know, it's just those milestones that, 
you, you really can't be a dad or be a father without achieving. It's just like, you know, you look back on my career stats, you know, we know that on um, August the 28th, I mean, uh, yeah, August the 28th, you know, Marcellus was going in routine diaper change and uh, you know, things got a little complicated down there, That's right. <laughs> but uh, it's all good. So, Well, that's great. Well, have fun with uh, your sleep deprivation and uh, you know, welcoming your daughter into the world. I want to go back. Where, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Lexington? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Lexington. So, grew up, uh, you know, went to Taste Creek. So, I went to uh, Mill Creek Elementary, Taste Creek Middle School, Taste Creek High School. So, I uh, lived in the same house my entire uh, childhood, and uh, you know, we, we had some some fun times being being out Creek as as we called it. So, and then why, why basketball? Why did you choose that sport? Man, I uh, as as crazy as it is, man, I, I was actually probably a better football player than basketball player as I was a kid coming up. Um, and part of the reason I, I enjoyed basketball more than football was because I wasn't as good. So, and I was a little little bigger, um, chubbier as a kid and things like that. And I, I still had game, but football just came a little easier. Just really wasn't as, um, didn't really get the the competition out. I mean, I love to hit people and things like that, but you know, just if you're physically bigger than guys on the football field, you know, you, you've got a tremendous advantage. And again, on the basketball court, I was still good size, but I wasn't as fast as guys. It was difficult to play defense, you know. But uh, I I loved it. I loved uh, you know, just just working on my game and uh, playing with the guys, going to travel a little more, um, and more importantly, I actually loved basketball practice. That was uh, one of the biggest differences. I hated football practice, couldn't dread it. I mean, I dreaded it, but basketball, I actually loved it. And, you know, my dad, uh, man, I remember watching uh, Grant Hill just as I was coming up, probably even as early as two years old, three years old. But I was watching Grant Hill, Tim Duncan, my two favorite players growing up, man. And uh, I, I literally wanted to be just like them. I felt like I looked like them as a kid growing up. They, they were guys that, you know, we're always in front of me. And, uh, you know, basketball was just just what I was living, breathing, and even sleeping and dreaming about. So Nice. And when did you know you were good among your age level? Uh, was there a moment? Yeah, th- th- there was a couple moments. And what it was, I actually knew I was really good when my, my neighbors that lived behind me, um, they had a they, – they put a slab of concrete down and uh, had a nice little goal out there, one of the first guerrilla basketball goals. So again, you could adjust the height and everything, and it was fine. And they had an older brother; he was about four or five years older than me. And um, I remember going out there just playing. And normally, when the older kids came on the court, you know, the the younger kids, you know, we'd watch or whatever. But you know, they, they'd never pick us up. One day, we're short a guy, and you know, I'm getting bullied around and stuff like that. Then I, I got mad, and I think I ended up winning the game and, you know, had to go low blocking shots to the backboard and, you know, goes probably six feet, <laughs> seven feet, if that. But uh, that's when I really realized, like, man, it was my first time playing with the big guys. And then uh, I felt like I was actually better than them. <laughs> but then I guess just taking that same experience just in the backyard and translating to playing up, you know, even being eight, nine years old, playing with 10 years old, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, and still being able to compete. Um, that's when I really knew that, okay, you know, I, I think I might have a chance with basketball, but more importantly, I just love playing and, and having fun. So that was, uh, th- that was really probably, I always felt like I belonged in the basketball court. Did you play against older, now as you progressed through your basketball career, did you keep playing with older guys throughout? Always, man, always, always. And, you know, <laughs> we, we might get into this a little later, but, um, man, I was always playing. I remember being, a, you know, Going into my freshman year of high school, we had uh, what well, let me backtrack. Starting the seventh grade, I played uh, freshman basketball, and then uh, you know, I also practiced with the JV team as well. Um, as long as I didn't have anything going on middle school, um, if I didn't have anything middle school and high school was going on, you know, I was up there with the high school guys. Um, and then my freshman year, I remember going to uh, it was going into my freshman year of the summer. And if you've been in Lexington, you know, you're not a true Lexington Hooper. If you've never been to, um, you know, a, a, a transit camp, a transit team camp or something like that. So uh, I remember I was playing freshman JV varsity, um, even before I even stepped foot in high school. 
And, um, you know, just, just always played up AAU the same way, 15, 16, 17 U. And one of my biggest regrets now that I was looking back at it is, you know, when you get have health, uh, health, health injuries and things like that, different difficulties, I think a lot of it was just because I was playing so many games from the time I was, you know, 12 years old all the way up through, you know, 17, 18 years old. So, uh, you know, I always played as much as I could, even if it meant I was playing, you know, two or three years ahead of me. So, you know, that's funny. You bring up the Transylvania basketball camp. Was that Don Lane's camp then, or was that Brian's? Uh, Brian Lane. Brian Lane. Okay, so I grew up going to Don Lane's. Yeah, who's, yeah. Who's Brian's dad, legendary coach yeah. at Transylvania University. And for those of you that have never heard of Transylvania, don't worry. We've all every time anyone ever heard hears that name, they're like, "What? You know, Dracula? Is that where Dracula coaches?" But no, Transylvania is in downtown Lexington, Kentucky. And I remember my dad growing up uh, would never send me to UK's camp because he said, that's too expensive. And all you're going to do is, is do layups and get autographs. He goes, you're going to Transy's camp. And everyone calls Transylvania Transy. He said, you're going to Transy's camp to learn. And one of the things about Transy's camp is you learn fundamentals. And I, I went to my, you know, one thing my father did was he's like, hey, you're going to pick five different basketball camps this summer. Because maybe I'd learn something different and meet some new friends. So we, I'd go to Eastern Kentucky, Pikeville, Cumberland, Tennessee Tech, Austin P, different camps all over, and uh, I probably did learn more fundamentals at Transy's camp. And then fast forward, I actually worked probably four summers at that camp. And morning session, you know, you always start out with an hour of fundamentals, and it was pick and rolls, pick and roll this situation, pick and roll that situation. And in the afternoon session, you'd start again with fundamentals. And, and games were secondary, and I don't know. You might know this better than I. I, I do now because you're more in that in that world. But are there still camps out there now where you can get that much of a fundamental base, or is it all playing oh, now? Man, there, there definitely is. Um, and being all the way honest, um, you know, just a kind of a shameless plug. Um, you know, just being in the in the events business, in sports basketball business, um, that that's one of the things. You, you actually would try to be able to emulate and especially we do at all of our events as far as the good balance of fundamentals and skill building and competition. So, you know, everything we do over at KBC hoops um, is really kind of predicated on, you know, how can we get these kids better? You know, we've got them up for eight hours, you know, what's the best use of the eight hours without going overboard and making sure everybody's still fresh. So when it comes to just different teaching aspects of the game, um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, if you're not working on your fundamentals, you know, you're wasting your time. And I tell people this all the time, man, it's, you know, a lot of people have it twisted on the basketball camp lane, you know, third, fourth grade, you know, everybody wants to be ranked. Everybody wants to have the the, the hoop mixtape, the, the ball is life. Um, you know, everybody wants to go viral on social media and everything. But it's really one of those things where all you got to do is if you just get a little bit better every single day, and I don't care if you're at the best basketball camp or the worst basketball camp um, with the right mentality, you know, you can still get something out of every single situation, you know, and this is something that also translates to life. So, um, you know, fundamentals aside, if you can just work on those and the better you get, the more you work on your fundamentals. So which is kind of a cliche thing that a lot of people really don't understand. So, you know, those are fundamental camps, pivoting, ball fake, pump fake, uh, boxing out, uh, you know, passing the ball ahead, dribbling with your head up, um, you know, keeping the ball low. And just those things that sound very anal and kids get bored with. I mean, that's what is going to literally propel you to success in basketball and anything in general. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know I did work when I first got the election Christian. That's we had a year of Billy Gillespie as a coach at University of Kentucky. And in the following years, when Coach Calipari got hired, and I worked the very first Kentucky camp that he showed up to or he ran and uh, after just working my tail off at transit camps all those years this camp was the easiest money I ever made because fundamentals might have been like very minimal and then bam you're playing games and like I was coaching with who was I coaching with uh Josh Harrelson and I think Ramon Harris does that sound right yeah and uh great guys but the kids just wanted to hang out with them, get autographs. And then when Calipari walked in the gym, that's when he was at his peak because he just arrived. He was going to be the savior of Kentucky basketball. And the problem was the parents. Like they had to keep almost security around Calipari because he would have been signing autographs for 12 hours straight for more so the parents than the for kids. Sure. 
For so sure. just uh... and, 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 and yeah, man, it, it's 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 growing up in Kentucky and around the state. You know, as you know, we don't have a pro basketball team. You know, but Kentucky basketball, you know, especially with the resurgence of Calipari coming in, you know, those guys are rock stars <laughs> still to this day. You know, but you know, even going over the years, nothing was like that that first class. Um, as far as, you know, even from the, from the arrival, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it was a lot of buzz going on in the city and, you know, that was, that was must see whether you were a basketball fan or, or whatever, you know, everybody knew that, uh, you know, coach Cal was just moved into Richmond road, <laughs> you know, every house is accessible every you ride by it every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you got John wall who had probably the best high school mixtape like ever, <laughs> on campus and everything. So it was a, it, it was a fun time, but again, those guys were larger than life. And again, back to your original point, you know, it, it was more paparazzi, uh, you know, type of ish, uh, you know, I just want to go see the guys taking pictures and doing those things. So. Well, I'll tell you what, that first week of camp, uh, the first night was the first time all those guys played pickup together. And I was there, and it was packed. It was probably 9 PM. No kid went to his room to eat pizza or go to the pool. Everyone was just packed, probably five deep, and there were some parents that, that heard about it. And you had John Wall, Eric Bledsoe, uh, DeMarcus Cousins, Josh Harrelson, Daniel Orton might have been there too. And the one thing I remember is DeMarcus Cousins was the pure alpha. And he was dropping F-bombs. He was talking smack to the seniors. And I, and I was sitting there cringing like, oh, man, we got five-year-olds here. But DeMarcus was such an alpha, and he was doing anything he wanted to, like banging threes, bringing up the court, blocking shots. And, you know, no one ever even talked about Eric Bledsoe, really. And he was an 18-year-old that was just jacked, like, you know, a 30-year-old man. And uh, it was unbelievable. And the way – I mean, it was still rusty, but you could just see the pure talent in all these 18 for, and 19-year-olds. Sure. Yeah, the talent, you, you know, like, okay, well, these guys are definitely different. <laughs> yeah, but that first pickup game was just uh, – it, it was must-see TV. And I don't know if anyone ever took any video. Actually, I don't know if there was that much video cameras back in 2009, but uh, that was cool to experience. All right, so um, back to camps too. Uh, you know, one thing I've always learned is like, you know, if i got to go to a business conference or if I've got to read a book, one thing that's been kind of a popular saying is if you can grab one thing from a book or learn one thing from a conference – you know, what do you, it's worth it. And I remember, you know, one thing, I wasn't a very good player, but I just was scrappy. But one thing I could do good was free throws, right? Led Lexington Catholic. I was very good in my college career with that. And it came from just a station at Tennessee Tech's university, my freshman year or after my freshman year. And it's just the way the guy explained it, that I did it just like that the rest of my career. And, you know, had pretty good percentages. So you never know as a kid when someone's going to say something that sticks to you, when someone's going to teach you a fundamental that, that you're going to carry throughout your life. So it, to, to me, it's exciting being a kid because you just never know like when that moment's going to happen. And that's not just with basketball. That's with, with life too, you know, whatever tidbit you get that, that that'll change everything. So um, that along as telling kids, hey, every time you're in the gym, you've got to pretend like there's a closed camera or closed circuit camera in the corner going to your dream coach's desk. And every time he looks over, you know, he's going to see how you're performing because you never know who's a friend of a friend and, and this and that. And, and quick story, I know Patino, when he was at Kentucky and Louisville, had this old-time New York guy. I can't remember his name, but he would send him to gyms and just have the guy go sit in the top corner, whether it's during a practice, and a shoot-around, or, or a real game, and watch how the kid performed when Rick Patino wasn't in the gym. Like when Patino walks in the gym, kids are going to turn it up. But what do you do on a Tuesday night in like a, a just a just a, a throwaway game almost? How are you going to react then? And just I tell kids you got to be paranoid. What, what do you say about that as far as like picking up tips and then you know playing like someone's watching you all the time? Yeah, man, it, it's really it's really you're, you're you're doing yourself such a huge disservice if if that isn't your mentality, because again, it, it's really one of those things where it's a test it's a it's a test of character, and you know just like you know in the hallways at school or whatever you're doing, you know, th there's always more at stake and you never know who you're around. You never know who's going to be the next person that knows that next person that can get you to where you're trying to go. So, um, you know, really it's, it's also too, just not taking any opportunity for, for granted. So, you know, just really understanding that every situation 
is number one, a blessing, but number two, an opportunity, you know, to showcase for you to go out and prove. And then again, man, it's, it's, it's fun. It, it, it is basketball. And especially as a, as a kid growing up, you know, going to camps, um, you know, being able to still be infatuated with basketball guys. And, um, you know, you, you never know what that lesson is going to be. But whatever it is, you got to make sure that you're receiving of it. And uh, it can really change your life. And, you know, just as a, as a quick example, um, I remember, again, just playing with the older guys always, you know, whether it was the blue courts playing, um, you know, um, a junior dirt bowl as a kid, you know, when I was supposed to be playing in the Sun Bowl, um, you know, playing at the North Lexington YMCA um, with older guys. And I, I'll never forget, man, my, my freshman year, um, I was playing at the North Lexington YMCA and playing with some older guys. And it was right before the season. So this would probably be September. And um, man, guarding this old guy, and I'm, 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 I'm killing him. I'm, I'm literally killing him. I'm just trying to get ready for varsity games. So I'm playing against older guys. Um, and I'm, I'm getting ready to back tip a guy, and he hits me with an elbow right in my mouth, right in my mouth, you know, which again, first time that's really happened to me like that. And it, it was an intentional elbow. But again, dude is, you know, 35 years old. You know, I'm 14. <laughs> So mouth is bleeding, all blood and everything. And, uh, you know, I go to the bathroom. I'm changing my mouth and everything. And, you know, just an old guy was in there in, in the Y changing, probably butt naked. <laughs> and, uh, man, what, what happened to you? I mean, I hit with an elbow. He said, man, let, let, let me guess. You were probably trying to go back to on a guy. And he probably just came with an elbow to you. I said, yeah, man, like, as you know, he was like, man, that's the oldest trick in the book. And uh, he said, man, you got to make sure that you're always protecting yourself. and you know, just on the basketball court, and not anything in, in a malicious way, but really understanding that, you know, it, it, it's a different type of understanding of knowing that, okay, you know, if I can go out here and compete, but still protect myself for longevity's sake, um, you know, because now I, I've got to wear a mouthpiece, you know, my teeth are adjusted, I got to go to the dentist and all that stuff. And it's just like, over a pickup game, you know, trying to get a back tip, and it's like, man, just protect yourself. And, you know, you might have to get a little dirty. You might have to get a little mean to fight. But, you know, you don't want to be on the bad end of that too many times. But, um, you know, at that point on, you know, really just knowing, okay, if I'm going to try to go get a back tip, I got to go run through the ball <laughs> to the point to where, you know, it, it's not going to be me getting knocked. If anything, I'm going to knock him down trying to get this ball. But those little things right there to where now, you know, if I'm running somebody down on court, whether it's a back tip or a block, you know, there's almost like a killer type of instinct that has evolved based on, you know, years and years ago of, you know, literally being embarrassed and, you know, having to go to the dentist and wear a mouthpiece all season because, you know, you were really soft and weren't going after it, <laughs> if we're really being honest. So it's a little one thing that's always stuck with me, man. Good thing to know you've got fake. Is that fake teeth up front you have now? Or? It's, it's not fake, man. I had to, uh, you know, essentially like almost like Invisalign before Invisalign. I had to wear this uh, this mouthpiece essentially, and it readjusted them. And I had to like uh, try to push my teeth over with my tongue. And then one day, just they just came back in place. But yeah, it was it was crazy, man. <laughs> just going off to teeth story. And when I was a sophomore at the Air Force Academy, I dove for a ball, and my teammate landed on me, and my head went into the hardwood, and I shattered one of these teeth, and it shattered up the root. So for ten months. Uh, as just turned 21 year old, uh, I had like this gnarly fake tooth and like one brace and every month I had to go in and get it adjusted. Every month I had to get needles deep into my brain just so I wouldn't feel what they were doing. And, uh, it's a rite of passage. I mean, it's just every, it seems like everyone <laughs> chips a tooth. You have to. And, and exactly. <laughs> I just tell kids, Hey, we're, we're a mouth guard, right? This stuff is not you, fun. You gotta, you gotta chip a tooth. You gotta break a, break a finger. You gotta sprain an ankle you know, and, and all those things. And, you know, it's just, it's just part of it. But now when I go to the dentist, I tell him, hey, you can put as many needles in me as you need to. I, it, it won't bother me. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk. I know we're going to get into D1 here because that's what every kid wants. But you actually played D1 at IUPUI. What I want you to tell me is um, how – let me ask you this. When was your first offer, your D1 offer, and how did that feel when you actually got the – Man, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you what's crazy – I wasn't as excited with my first D1 offer as I was the first time playing in front of co college coaches. 
um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you grow up as a kid just watching college basketball, you know, watching the Syracuse, the Dukes, the Kansas, the North Carolina, the, being in the backyard of Kentucky. Um, but it, it, it's a different type of feeling when, you know, you're, you're, you're playing like you always do. And, you know, a gym is packed full of every coach in the country. So before I got my first offers, of course, just playing AAU basketball in the summers, you know, for a couple of years, you start to play around those guys and, you know, it's like you do something, you know, they might tap their, tap their assistant coach on the shoulder or whatever, whatever it is, start getting letters and things like that. But really just those interactions and, you know, the acknowledgement of knowing that, okay, you know what, I know that they're recruiting this guy right here and, you know, I'm not competing too. So really I'm coming for your spot in your mind. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that, that was really one of the, one of the first exciting experiences that I really had as far as, again, another feeling of belonging, like I can play at the division one level. Um, and then in terms of my actual offers, the only official offer I had was to IEPY. Um, well, I'll say this, they were my first official offer and, um, they were actually my first official visit as well. And, um, you know, I had some other visits set up. I had visits set up with, uh, Lehigh, Furman, Wofford. Um, I think, I think maybe then EKU and Moorhead state, they were both recruiting me, but I really wanted to get out of Kentucky. Um, so I remember like, you know, I just wasn't really interested in those two schools, just only because logistically, not because lack of opportunity or anything and being appreciative. I just wanted to get a little, get away a little bit. Um, but yeah, IEPY was my first offer and um, I essentially committed. Um, I shut my recruitment down after my, after my first visit up there. So. Gotcha. Um, and, and you picked IEPY that's, and you played there four years and you know you've got some great stats there from what I saw. Once you stopped playing, did you play overseas for a little bit? Yeah, I played in Germany for one year, man. I played okay. in Germany for one year. I played in uh, Würzburg, Germany, home of Dirk Nowitzki. And uh, man, it was so crazy. My, my last year of college, just probably the well, college was when I really started having some injuries, man. Um, messed my back one year, came back from my back injury. And broke my foot the very like that that first game broke my foot so i missed my whole second year of college um essentially and then um you know my my, my second years or well, my second and third playing years which were my third and fourth year in school um you know i was actually fairly healthy and then going into my senior year um battled some health problems with my with my knees um maybe a couple other things but again i remember just being in those situations going back to my point originally like, man, I think I've literally played too many games and my body started to deteriorate. It wasn't due to a, uh, a lack of preparation or conditioning. Um, you know, and again, I can honestly say I've, I, I really don't remember ever losing a sprint in college. Wasn't the fastest guy by any means, probably one of the slowest guys on the team, at least athletic, um, but never not finished a workout. <laughs> um, never, you know, just, just things I really took pride in. So when I battled those injuries going into my senior year, I had essentially my senior year of college basketball, I had essentially, you know, hopped off the side of the road, man, and was ready for, you know, the next person to, you know, I ride in the backseat, man, it's, it's y'all's vehicle now. So um, I was going to be done with it after the season, had opportunity to continue playing, um, agents reaching out some things. And I was kind of on the fence about if I wanted to go pursue playing or not. And I knew that I wanted to get into speaking and, involved in youth interacting with them and um, I realized that a lot of my speaking was really going to be based around um, you know pursuing dreams and you know being relentless in that pursuit and being able to find whatever that dream is maybe it's even in a different avenue so I felt like a dream of mine was always of course to make the league but you know more than anything being a professional athlete um, having that opportunity just right on the cusp I felt like I was doing myself a disservice and I wouldn't be able to really speak with supreme um, confidence and be authentic, being so close to my dreams and turning back on them. So I decided that that's really what pushed me over the hump, got me to go, you know, hop on a plane and head over to Germany for a year, played, enjoyed them and actually played phenomenal. The best basketball I played in my life by far. Um, one of the best experiences I've had in my life from a, 
um, not only a basketball standpoint, but just from a, a, a maturing aspect of, you know, just coming into to manhood and things. So, um, you know, I definitely enjoyed it. Had opportunity to continue playing, but um, man, I only wanted to play like four or five years. And um, I realized that just even from a financial aspect, you know, it's going to take literally, you know, probably three to four years for you to make the money that you thought you were going to be making in year one. Um, which again, the overseas life is amazing once you get to that point of financial stability and things like that. Um, but it was like, you know what, after those four to five years, I have a little money in my pocket, but I'll still be where I'm at right now in terms of the professional sense um, in the working world. So I decided to, uh, you know, just begin doing some things professionally to grow and, you know, just ultimately uh, uh, got involved in some other things and being involved in basketball as an actual player kind of became less and less appealing to me just with everything else I had going on. And surprisingly enough, the thing that got me to quit playing basketball um, finally was actually, you're going to laugh me when I tell you this, but it was, it was a basketball opera. So I, I choreographed a basketball opera wow. um, and did some other things, but yeah, it, it was literally through the arts and telling a story of basketball through literally opera, music, theater, um, that really pushed me away from basketball as a player. So again, that's a, that might be another story for another day, but um, probably one of the coolest experiences of my life, man. I feel, I, matter of fact, I feel like you right now. I feel like that's probably my, my most interesting man in the world claim to fame where I can literally say that, you know, I've been involved in the creative process of an actual opera. <laughs> And was that in Germany or is that here in the U.S.? Man, it, it's crazy. It was literally right here in Lexington, and it's a. It, it was only, you know, I, it, it was literally a, a, an amazing blessing. So I was actually, and it, it, everything comes full circle. So I was actually um, at. It was KBA at the time. This would have been back in two thousand and summer of 2000, two thousand. This was two summer of two thousand seventeen. And um, I just got back from Germany, literally got back, probably hadn't been home for two weeks. And, you know, just for money, just trying to figure out, okay, well, now I got to go make some money. What can I do? And, um, man, I was literally headed up to KBA, um, had, a, had a game or something. And on my way up there, I got a call from uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Um, Everett uh, McCorvey, and he's director of UK Opera Theater. And, um, you know, I actually used to coach his son, his son played at Asbury University at the time. Um, and they were partnering with the production company out of New York. And uh, we're going to do this big basketball opera here in Lexington. And they needed somebody to help teach the, uh, the singers, the actresses and actresses, how to get some semblance of basketball skill. And I was the first person that popped in his mind. So he called me and I'm like, you know, he's got to do like training or what? And uh, long story short, that was the initial conversation. Ended up doing that on the choreographic side, ended up directing, um, you know, I'm plugging through the script. <laughs> um, and then also too, ended up setting up a program. Um, it was basically, um, it was basically told the story of two, two high school kids playing basketball in the inner city and uh, touched on different areas through basketball. So like gun violence, um, just decision-making, some things like that. So I also created a, uh, um, a community program where we would go to the schools, partner, and we would, uh, you know, essentially tell these stories of just decision making and maturing and growing up, um, and introducing kids through the arts of music and theater through basketball. So ended up doing that, super super successful. Um, and again, probably, you know, not only financially was it a good opportunity for me, but just from a confidence boost, as you know, once I finished that, it was like, man opera like i've literally made money in opera like man nobody can tell me anything right now like, i can i got a chance to do whatever i want to do so probably one of the most empowering moments uh, of my life through opera so again <laughs> that's great you might be the only guy that has it in a resume <laughs> <laughs> and, and the crazy part about it is i actually had to perform an opera too did it all oh did great all. one man band had to sing can't really? sing by the way wow. man listen Two days before, we had a guy that was supposed to be singing, and uh, he went MIA. Like, 
I haven't talked to him to this day. Showed up to everything. Probably this was a whole year process. Was there every day for a whole year. Two days before, it just goes off the grid. You know, I'm checking, you know, morgues. I'm looking at the, the busted papers and no sign of this guy. He's just vanished. And, uh, you know, needed somebody to fill in. And I was the only person that could know the script in two days. So. <laughs> and that's probably, was that one of your career highlights or life highlights was doing that? Man, honestly, that, that might be at the top of the list, if I'm being all the honest. Yeah. No, no exaggeration, because it was completely out of my comfort zone. Even though it was with basketball, you know, just it, it, it was still quite a bit of discomfort um, within it. But, you know, I realized, man, if I could just try to use past experiences to relate and everything is kind of translated, it was it was phenomenal, man. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing that. That's really neat. Not every day what, you hear about that. Is, I, I, I might have to go into the archives, pull some footage for you. But, uh, man, it, it, it's, it's called Bounce the Basketball Opera. And, again, man, I got involved in its infancy. Um, it's actually growing pretty, pretty big now. Um, they've done shows in Brooklyn, um, doing some other things around the country and things. So um, it, it's, it's, I didn't realize how big it was when I got involved. But, um, you know, looking back at it, it was, it was amazing, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, find some of the archive footage. I think that'd be pretty, I will. I pretty will. interesting to see. I will. Well, let's get into the fun part here. Let's start talking a little bit about recruiting. Now, you work with youth parents all the time from from all different ages and a lot of parents are investing money to one day have it be paid off for a scholarship um i know my dad personally uh, broke it to me in high school and he said hey we're giving you every opportunity we're not paying for college so <laughs> you either get a scholarship or you're you're on your own but you're leaving the house Absolutely. after graduation and that was a lot of pressure but mind you you know you're six five with a skill set i was i'm six seven so you and i at least had some marketable attributes um, and not everybody has that. So um, with this, you know, obviously I work in the prep school world and, you know, everyone's going to get a good taste of that if they listen to enough of these episodes on the benefits and all of that. But for kids in a state like Kentucky where it's pretty talented, yet there's not that many colleges nearby. Like, let's first, let me first ask you, what's the common, the most common question you get from parents and when you get that question what do you tell them <laughs> yeah i mean the most common question it's really not even a question um but it leads into questions but it's it's uh you know get a phone call a text message whatever it is and you know where can i go to get my kid exposure you know that that's probably the number one question um and again it, it's a very very open-ended question um, and, you know, real quickly, you realize that, you know, exposure is almost an, an afterthought. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, you know, and how that conversation goes is, well, you know, you're wanting exposure. Well, number one is, you know, well, what, what grade your child in? Um, and you'd be surprised, man, but this actually comes a lot from just as much as it comes from high school kids. You know, you, you get elementary parents that ask the same questions. Um, you know, where everybody wants to play on a shoe team. Um, everybody wants to go to the, the, uh, the most popular camp in the country. And, you know, people think that exposure is the end all be all that if I can get in front of the eyes of coaches, um, I can impress. And to that point, it's really, you know, well, what are you doing? to make sure that your production is where it needs to be. You know, your skill set is where it needs to be. And a lot of times you truly find out that, you know, well, you're wanting exposure, but I'll tell you right now that, you know, your 2.0 GPA is not gonna cut it, you know, for being a division one athlete um, and things like that. So that is the initial question that really allows us to kind of divulge information um, in a very, very productive and, and helpful way. I mean, also too, you always get the, the questions, you know, when it does time for kids to make decisions um, about life after high school, whether it's, uh, you know, pursuing college or working or, you know, the, the prep school versus college route. Um, you always get those type of questions. Um, and again, everybody thinks that they're a D1 player. Um, and, you know, I'll be the first to tell everybody, college basketball is college basketball, you know, regardless of level, you know, prep school basketball is prep school basketball, like any type of post-secondary basketball, any opportunities, you know, are all blessings. And, you know, everybody in the NBA, there's guys from everywhere. <laughs> so 
it really doesn't you, you can literally get to where you want to go being exactly where you are because somebody before you has done it and that's whether you're in a rural town you know in eastern kentucky whether you're you know in a heavy populated city like louisville or lexington you know there's there's examples and there's opportunities you know if you're good enough if you're good enough you know you should be able to get seen there's a couple cases where guys you know actually do need exposure just because you know for whatever reason they are getting overlooked but for the most part you know if, if you're putting the work in and um you know you're producing then you know usually those opportunities will reveal themselves regardless of what camp you go to what AAU team you play for um and those things it's just more so about if individually you're qualified both academically and athletically um you got a good head on your shoulders and you know you can conform to a team setting and not be a knucklehead you know there, there's opportunities for you yeah and one thing a lot of parents will ask me that have kids that might be borderline ivy league kids or at least they want to go that route they're worried about this prep school versus that prep school and what i tell them is you need to look at the ivy league rosters i said not every kid in that roster is from a prep school you'll see plenty of kids on there from just public schools right so just because you go to a prep school or uh you're on a certain AU team does not mean you're going to miss out on certain opportunities. So it's not a foregone conclusion. So you're right. I mean, even Kentucky will take kids from a public school. McDonald's all Americans can be from a public school. So it's not, you don't have to go to a private school or a boarding school to do that. So that's something parents need to know as well. It's not guaranteed. And you might pay a lot of money for private school tuition. It's, it doesn't mean you're going to get a guaranteed result at the end of it either. Exactly. Exactly. And that's with anything, man. That, that, that's what everybody's looking for. The, you know, that, that promised path or anything. And the reality is, you know, I, I can't, I honestly can't guarantee that, you know, you'll even have a shot at college because again, there, there it, there's so many, but the best thing you can do is, you know, just check all the boxes. And if you can literally go out and check all your boxes, make sure that you're doing everything right. You're positioning yourself in the best situations possible. Um, you know, that's, that's all you can do. And a lot of that deals literally with things that are in your absolute control. <laughs> and, you know, that's, you, you can't, you can't live your life, you know, and, you know, just wait, hope and pray on a result coming from somebody else. You know, all you can do is check your box. And the reality is, you know, everybody's not going to go play college basketball. There's nothing wrong with it. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, and again, nobody wants to really hear that when it's, you know, comes down to little Johnny. Um, but they're, they're, all you can do is check the boxes. And again, like, like, like yourself, for example, you know, your job, you're going to check every boxes, every box, you know, give somebody the best opportunity at making whatever they say their dreams are come true. And that's all you can really do. Yeah. A couple of things on that too, is if you want to play college ball, there's probably a spot for you. Now, you might not be getting a scholarship. You might be number 19 on the bench, and you might be playing at an NAI school in one of the Dakotas. But there is a place for you. It just, is that worth your quality of life to be in a situation like that versus just giving it up? And like we've discussed before, every time you bump up a level in competition, there's less and less spots. And it's tougher and tougher and tougher. And sometimes people, this is their only opportunity to get out of the situation they're in. So, you know, if... If you're going up against that kind of drive and determination, you're going to have to bring it even more. So that's one thing. And another thing about recruiting, too, when you talk about checking the boxes, I've heard over and over again major college coaches ask this question, you know, what do you look for in a player? And there's talent everywhere out there. These, these major guys are seeing it day and night. But the one thing they have to have that's, that's a no-brainer is the character box checked. Now, DeMarcus Cousins, we mentioned that earlier, how he probably didn't have the best character his first you know, few weeks at Kentucky, but his talent overrided that. And there's very few of those guys out there, right? And even do you even want to be that kind of teammate anyway? Um, but character is one of the things that, that you have to have that checked. Also, just in the prep school world, when I'm talking about a kid to a prep school, a prep school in most colleges too don't just want to see you play basketball. They want to see, obviously, you check the box of – getting good standardized test scores, getting a good GPA, but they also want to know more of a narrative. Like, do you volunteer? Do you speak another language? Do you play a another instrument? And you being more than just a basketball player brings breadth to that program, to that school, 
And it's just, so just, you can specialize for sure. But, you know, once again, you only have one youth, you know, one childhood. So if you've got something else that interests you, yeah, spend some time on your grades, on your basketball, but pursue other things as well. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things, man. I always, uh, I used to get offended, man. And, you know, it, it, it happens to this day. And I, I never put kids in this situation. It's, you know, well, well, what's your backup plan? If basketball doesn't work out, what's your backup plan? And, you know, rather than that thinking, I, I think that thinking kind of gets kids just so locked in on one thing because there's so much resentment in a kid, you know, that hears that. It's like, well, I'm, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. So everything is focused and centered around this one thing. But, you know, rather it's basketball and what, you know, what do you want to do? You know, basketball and what, you know, you, you, you can't play basketball forever. You know, and again, there's a good likelihood that, you know, the ball is going to stop bouncing at some point, unless you're LeBron James. I think LeBron might play forever. But, <laughs> but you know, more than anything, there's so many things along the way that you can take advantage of and different opportunities that literally just all come and stem around basketball. So really, in order to get the full experience, at any level of basketball, it's really being able to explore the opportunities and the different um, avenues and areas that come from it, whether it's, you know, joining a club, being in a leadership position at school, you know, these things all kind of go hand in hand. And the only way to really maximize the whole basketball experience is to be able to take advantage of some of the things that, you know, basketball has, or because of basketball, you're, you're exposed to these things now. So. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this, and you might have to drop names or you might not, but is there a player out there that went D1 where you were surprised? And on the opposite of that question, is there a kid that did not go D1 where you're like, wow, people are missing on this guy and, and he's going to murder it at whatever level he is? Oh, yeah, D1. for sure, for sure. Man, there's, there's two guys in particular, and they're actually both from Lexington. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, you, you do have guys that, actually get quite overlooked um, in a variety of ways. But there, there are some factors there um, that are usually at play as to why guys get overlooked sometimes. Um, you know, but sometimes it, it's just literally like you, you really just almost unfathomable how, you know, these guys aren't getting opportunities. One guy I played with um, at Tate's Creek growing up, um, D. Gibson, he ended up, uh, you know, and, and again, the, the, our, our, the way we played at high school basketball, you know, wasn't really conducive to to him specifically. And, you know, had he been able to be unleashed a little more, you know, and literally be, you know, third leading scorer on the team and things like that, and, you know, being able to probably score more points as a team, um, you know, I think he would have probably had a lot more opportunities as well. Um, he ended up going to junior college. He went to uh, East Arizona out of high school and then went to uh, Barton down in Texas, but um, ended up then going to Samford, played well, you know, all conference performer. But, you know, I've known D since he was in sixth grade. We played middle school basketball together and he's always been one of the best players I've ever played alongside with. Um, but for whatever reason, when it came to the recruiting aspect of everything, he just kind of got overlooked, um, you know, but again, he was still able to get on in junior college. But like you said, the opportunity to play college basketball is out there. And he had to go to Eastern Arizona <laughs> to go play, but he did it. He did it. Um, and it worked out for him. Um, then another guy that I always felt like was overlooked was um, Isaiah Tisdale. He went to Henry Clay, um, ended up going to Vincennes University. And um, the only – he got at Vincennes, um, our AAU program, Charlotte Court here in Lexington. We had another guy that went to Vincennes some years before that and then ended up going to Coastal Carolina. Um and the coach knew what to look for. And the player reminded him of the player that he had from Lexington before. Um, but other than that, I mean, this kid was a, for sure, D1 player, in my opinion. Um, you know, always one of my favorite players, probably the, my favorite player I've ever watched or coached consistently, just game in, game out to this, to this very day. But uh, Isaiah Tisdale, he ended up going to uh, Vincennes. Um, you know, I think they lost in the uh, um, JUCO Final Four two years in a row. Um, ended up going to East Tennessee State. Amazing career. Actually won their conference this past year. Um, but, again, another D1 player that ended up doing well. But, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of guys, man, that 
the, the list goes on and on. Guys that and, – and what, what I tell you is too, man, it, it's not – it's usually not for lack of talent um, in, in whatever case. Some of the most talented guys, man, you, you'll see play elections, and, man, honestly, like, you know, may not ever go to college or whatever for whatever reason, you know, but – you're, you're 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 naive if you think that you're talented enough, and talent alone is what's going to be the determining factor in you know you getting the opportunity or not. It's all right. little things, like you said, the character box. Um, it, 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 it's it's rarely due to a lack of talent, um, because again, there's talented guys everywhere. I take you to the park right now, and you know there's a D1 basketball player somewhere out there um, on the talent scale, NBA guys on the talent scale, but you know. That's uh, interesting. You mentioned uh, Isaiah Tisdale because Coach Brown and Henry Clay actually called me yeah. after the season saying, hey, do you have yeah. a prep school for him? And at yeah. that time, I, I, I didn't have a good opportunity for him, so I was glad to see him doing well. Um, to finish up here, a couple more things. Parents come to me and they say, hey, which recruiting website should I sign up for? Have you seen these recruiting websites benefit parents at all, or are they more because personally, I've, I've not, as far as scholarship level. Now, I know they're good for maybe smaller uh, NAIA, D3, stuff like that. But what's your opinion being in that world? And what do you say when parents ask you about that? Yeah, man, and it, it's kind of a uh, it, it's kind of weird. But here's one thing I'll say. I'm glad that we do what we do, being in the world that we operate in. Because the reality is, um, you know, if it's anything that you're really paying money for, um, as far as a recruiting service or – you know, somebody making a highlight tape and all that stuff, all that stuff is good. But the best thing you can do is to attack yourself with a group um, or people that are just in the know of college basketball in the basketball world. So not even a monetary type of deal, um, but, you know, really go and get to know tournament directors, event organizers, um, you know, different coaches. Um, and more importantly, you know, as a parent, you've got to make sure that you're carrying yourself at the highest level. Um, because again, if, if you're a knucklehead in the stands, um, you know, or causing drama or anything with the team, you know, college coach doesn't want to deal with that. Um, so those right there are different factors, you know, talent alone, you know, a guy checks a character box, he checks the talent level, but you know, mom and dad are over there at knucklehead, <clears throat> you know, what, what that might, that's, that's another one of the boxes you've got to check. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, in, in terms of recruiting service and things like that, they're good. But the biggest thing you can do is be attached to somebody that has college coaches at their, at their fingertips with a phone call, um, you know, knows that, you know, I know that coach Shouse at Asbury is looking for this type of player. Um, you know, I know that this school is looking for this, this coach does this um, and being able to make personal phone calls on your behalf. But again, though, that's the whole process in itself. You got to position yourself humbly um, to be willing. But th there, there's so many people, man, that are actually out here doing things the right way. Um, you know, th there's a couple instances that, for whatever reason, you know, basketball organized, youth sports, tournament directors, uh, which I am one, <laughs> uh, you know, get get painted in a negative light. But you know, one thing I'll say is, if somebody comes to me with a question or I can help a kid out, you know, even no charge to you. Like I'm, I'm always going to pick up the phone and do what I can do to help somebody um, or whether it's connecting with you. Um, and, you know, um, I got a prep school question. Well, you know, 10 out of 10, I'm going to let you know, well, you know, I'm not even going to answer that question for you, but better yet, I'm going to send you to the guy that, that does this. So, you know, that's the biggest thing you could do. Just go out and get to know you, get to know guys like me, myself, our team, and just other guys, you know, in different parts of the country. Um, there's good guys that really, if, if, if somebody knows you, Corey, and somebody asks you a question about prep schools, you know, there's a good chance that what you say is going to be the real every single time just because you, you're an expert. You do it. <laughs> and, you know, offering advice and help and things like that. So whether you sign up for a recruiting service or whether they, you know, call you, you know, I, I would say calling you and talking to actual people is more of a surefire way than, um, you know, just – signing up to a mailing list and that's the thing too like there's experts in every every part of the basketball world up there we all know great strength coaches if i need a tournament question or an au question i call you i know a uh, juco advocate on twitter that that's brandon gobles runs that he's based out of here in colorado 
If I have any JUCO questions, I call Brandon because he's breathing it. He's talking to coaches every day. He's helping answer kids' questions. So it, it, it's a cliche statement, but it is about who you know, right? And it's about knowing the right guy to ask this question to, which guys to stay away from. That only comes to experience. You cannot learn that overnight. And, and people ask, like, well, I'd like to start, you know, personally, they ask me, hey, I'd like to start placing kids in prep school. And I say, great. And they go, how do I start? I go, well, first, you have to start meeting coaches, not just over the phone, but face-to-face. -face. And you need to start visiting schools. And you need to start placing kids for free. And you got to take on kids that might be 5'9", with a 2-3 GPA and no offers, right? And see how that works cold calling coaches. So this kind of stuff takes lifetimes to learn. The connections you have throughout Kentucky took your entire life of playing in Kentucky at a certain level and in certain places to get those connections too. So to parents, you know, every inch you grow, there's less kids at that inch, right? There's less six, seven kids than there are six foot kids, right? So if you're in that guard range, it's, you got to do all the things, you got to check all the boxes, like Marcellus said, and you also got to know people too. Because one thing in recruiting, like, the beauty of the internet now is you can email any coach in the country, right? But these coaches get 100 emails a day from kids all over the world. Do you think they have time to open them all? No. But are they going to answer an email or answer a call or text from someone they know? Yes, because they know Marcellus is not going to be wasting his time reaching out about a player unless Marcellus thinks he can be looked at appropriately at that level. Just like me, I'm not going to reach out to a college coach or a prep school coach unless I've got a kid I think – will be a good fit at their level. So it really is who you know and how do you how do you meet people? It just it takes time. I moved here to Denver, Colorado about a year ago. I couldn't just walk in a gym and just start start doing, you know, brokering deals with kids and, and talking to this and that. I have to slowly start asking people, hey, who do you know in the basketball world in Colorado? Who do I need to meet? Who are the Marcellus Barksdales and Tom Bowers in Colorado? And I've met those guys. And then they can tell me, hey, talk to these two guys. Maybe stay away from these two guys. So it takes time. None of this stuff happens overnight, just like developing your basketball skills, getting good grades. That stuff doesn't happen overnight either. So this is a long process. But the earlier families and kids hear this information, the better it can be for their future. But once again, like we say, nothing is guaranteed. This is not a fair sport. This is survival of the fittest. This is Darwinism. And sometimes it's luck. The one thing, this is the one thing I, I just, I cringe when a parent says it. And tell me if you, how many times you've heard this, Marcellus. That kid's got a D1 offer, but my kid outscored him or locked him up this one game. So I know my kid should get that same level D1 offer based on this one performance. Yeah, man. It, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it's so funny, man, how, you know, and again, I, I understand it. Everybody is, you know, gunning for the top dogs always. And, you know, feel like they are, you know, overlooked or they're more deserving of opportunity. And, you know, a lot of that could be valid for sure. But, you know, again, it, it's not like him taking this opportunity is really limiting your opportunities as well. Um, and then again, it, it's a, it's a normally with, with that type of thinking. Um, and again, there's probably some, some cases where it's an anomaly where, you know, for whatever reason, you know, there are kids that do get overlooked. I'm not naive to, to not think that. Um, you know, but most times having that mentality going into things usually lets me show that you really haven't checked all the boxes. Um, and that, you know, again, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, if you want to change the world, the best thing you can do is clean your own house, you know, start at home and, you know, everybody wants to get these opportunities, which are amazing. But again, though, you've got to check all your boxes and you've got to understand that again, it, it is a marathon and not a sprint. And, you know, I promise you coaches aren't offering kids off of one performance, you know, one sighting and things like that. It's something that takes time. Um, they've got to see a player grow. They've got to see how a player reacts with a bad game. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, yeah, you outscored them, but, you know, they number one, they won the game. Uh, number two, you know, the kid still had a triple-double. He, you, you, Your guy had 25, he had 20. <laughs> like, your stuff like that, it's not really apples to apples. Um, but again, man, somebody's always watching too, though. And, you know, again, if you're coming to me with a mentality like that and, you know, I'm in a situation to help your kid and the coach asked me about the kid and he asked me about the parents. And, you know, I, I know that the parents are, you know, secretly in the stands hoping that little Johnny scores more than, you know, 
his teammates or they're only cheering for little Johnny and not his teammates. And they ask me about the parents. I've got to tell them the truth. Um, only because if I come with anything that's not truth, um, and you know, this kid for whatever reason doesn't work out for this coach and this family doesn't work out for this coach. Well, now the next kid that comes along that is deserving, you know, probably takes a hit. So, you know, our job is to tell the truth that, that that's literally it. And that's really, you know, what, what the difference is. So, you know, again, just make sure that, you know, not only players, but parents, especially, man, just make sure that you're checking your box as well, being good parents, you know, being good teammates as well. So, and, and that's a great place to end. So Marcellus, thank you very much for being the first interview on the prep athletics podcast. It's actually, uh, from me being on your podcast a few months ago, that this is even into fruition and your feedback and help on this. So thank you very much. And I appreciate all your insights if people need to reach out and find you, where can they do that? Man, social media at MX Barksdale. Uh, that's MX B A R K S D A L E. KBC Hoops.com. Stay in the loop and they'll know with everything. Also, we got our KBC Hoops podcast, small hiatus, but uh, we'll be coming back to you guys real soon. Um, Lexington, Kentucky, you know, just not too hard to get in touch with. But again, I'd, I'd love to take questions or help out in whatever way I can for anybody. So. Well, that sounds good. Well, thanks so much. Get back to uh, getting a little rest while your daughter's sleeping right now. All right. <laughs> Have a great week, all right? All right. Thanks, Corey. You're Take welcome. Care.